Good morning, everyone. We are recording now. Welcome back I found to your the Instagram. 1020 oh, wow. Lecture. Hello, Mike, Ellis, hey. Mike, John, Riker. Riker, I'm digging this background. It's pretty cool. Thanks. Um, how's everyone oh, doing? Good. We have any wide good. awake? Yep. Okay. I wouldn't say wide awake, but. I've got some coffee. I'm ready to party? No tea. You sure that's coffee? This is whiskey for the morning. That's what they told me it was. I don't know. What is this stuff? <laughs> it's Irish coffee. It's Irish coffee. The coffee from the sewer it's just, from which the uh, raccoon coffee. came from. Um, so uh, today I've got some plans for us. We are going to finish our lecture on the sun. And if we can, we'll move into chapter 15, which is on stars in general. But... I have a feeling I could easily burn this entire day's lecture just doing the layers of the sun and nuclear fusion. Haha, <laughs> I get it. I get it. Sun burning through lecture. Haha. <laughs> okay, it's not, it's not really, right? Because fire is a chemical reaction. We talked about that last time, right? Well, yeah, that's true. Maybe but, like, what I'm going to try like... to do is fuse yeah. different concepts together. How about that? Okay. Oh, I get it. I get it. All right. <laughs> now, um, I have a lab for us today that has been well prepared. The lab that we're gonna do is on lenses and telescopes, okay? So uh, I think that's, let me take a quick look at our grade sheet here. That may be the previous lab or the next lab, let me see. But I wanted to have the setup just once this week and 1010 was doing it as well. And I thought it would be kind of a funny, more exciting uh, uh, lab for us to do than your typical lab. Let me just see here. I also have a couple of simple announcements to make about submitting homeworks. Okay, yeah, lab seven. Lenses and telescopes is lab seven. To do that, sh uh, to do that lab, at some point during this lecture, you're going to need to download or take out of your lab books the worksheet here. There's two pages. The pages are 8-5, and the other page is 8-6. That'll be all you need. And you can download them right from the assignment lab seven in our blackboard. Does that make sense to everyone? Yep. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you for uh, video chatting with me so that I can see some of your faces and kind of get a read on where you are. Uh, I, I have to talk a little bit about the submissions. Did you guys notice that I graded last week's assignment? I did not. I... Well, let me explain something. I used to really like grading in my office when I could take your physical papers, grade them fast, and put it into my Excel book. Now I've got to use this really clunky system called Blackboard. And the deal is with Blackboard, you have a homework assignment in one tab, and you have a lab assignment in the other tab, and you need to submit each homework assignment to each tab, or I can't grade it through Blackboard. Now, some of you did everything perfectly, but there were a number of people who would submit their homeworks and their labs to the same thing, like just your lab, just like your lab submission. And I can see that you've done your homework in your lab, but I can't grade your homework and give you 25 out of 25 in Blackboard unless you submit the homework to the homework tab. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? Yeah. All right. So if you aren't getting, you should look at your scores and make sure everything worked out. By the way, also, if you sent me a JPEG of your work, that's great. If you sent me a PDF or a scan, that's great. But some of you just sent me like the craziest stuff that I couldn't open, like random files with no extension on them or goofy links that didn't open up. Some of you sent me like files that said .heic. I, I don't know what that is. I can't open it. So I can't grade your homework unless I can see your homework. And there's a limited number of file formats. So I just don't want to have to figure this out with like 10 people at the end of the semester. I want you guys to learn how to do it right now. Does that make sense? And uh, yeah. a lot of the people that I'm talking to, it wasn't an issue, but I, I can't remember, there's too many of you for me to remember who did good and who did bad. So just kind of go ahead and maybe at the end of today or during the course of this lecture, if you start to drift off, just take a peek and see if your grades look okay. If you see a zero there, that means there was a problem with your submission. Oh, and make sure you actually submitted your homeworks in your labs. Some people just like submitted their lab and not their homework. So I, 
you know, and I knew that some of you were there because I saw your faces. So just check it out at the end, okay? Make sure everything's going fine. Um, I'm trying to keep a record in my Excel as well, but this could get confusing. Okay, so there's that. Now we've talked about that. Um, I guess, uh, unless there's any questions from you guys, we'll get right back into the sun. Does that sound good? Yep. Oh, by the way, you'll notice that I have uh, a new webcam, which in theory is high definition. Let's go to speaker view here. Let's double click on myself. It does do this really irritating autofocus thing, and I can't figure out for the life of me. I can turn off the autofocus in their own proprietary app, but unfortunately I can't use that at the same time as Zoom. So somehow Zoom and my camera are talking to each other and trying to autofocus, and I can't turn it off, and it's super, super irritating. But in any case, it should be a little bit easier to read the board now, so let's pick up where we left off. I remember talking to you guys and leaving off on, um, well, I remember talking about hydrostatic equilibrium, right? Riker, what are the last notes that you have, if you took notes? Uh, hydrostatic equilibrium. I think we uh, talked about the energy methods of the sun and how the sun uses fusion. I think that's what we started on. I don't think we got very far into that. Oh, okay. Well, let's start today with the layers of the sun. Uh, allow me to share my screen, share computer sound, and uh, let's go ahead and... No intro today? You know, I thought about playing the intro, and then I, I don't know, I didn't want to bore you guys. <laughs> but I probably should play the intro. That was the whole point, to play the intro every time. Um, let's see here. In astronomy, in the S drive... 1020 view detail. Oh, Gazuntite. Thank you. Okay. Um, it's not contagious. <laughs> well, I, I think it is. That's the whole point of what's going on right now, right? Uh, function <laughs> F5. Okay. So can you guys oh. see my PowerPoint slide there? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. What layer of the sun are we looking at? The I was photosphere. Gonna, that's right, the photosphere. Yeah. The photosphere is like the surface, but it's not a physical surface. Let's, um, let's find a slide that goes over the layers of the sun, and that's sort of what I want to start by getting into today. Function F529. Oh, nice. Thank you uh, for that contribution to my slideshow. Now, can you erase that shit, please? <laughs> or are you going to make me do it? definitely erase right. Hold on a second. Annotate. It wasn't me. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'm all about it. You guys can draw all over this thing as long as it doesn't totally disrupt my flow. Um, let's, let's come up with an analogy like a planet, okay? We're going to look at the six layers of the sun, and at some point we should also probably talk about the solar wind as well. The solar wind is not a layer of the sun but it is one of the types of emissions that the sun puts out. In fact, this is kind of getting my, my juices flowing here. I know what I want to do. Before we begin on the layers of the sun, I want to talk about the two types of emission that the sun is responsible for. The sun gives off two types of emission. Okay. Can you guys read that? It's auto focusing like that. Yeah. It's pretty rotten. Yeah, okay. no, okay. okay. yeah. It's a bit blurry, but it's readable. Is it blurry because of autofocus or is it blurry because it's blurry? I blame the autofocus. Uh, I blame autofocus. Yeah, I blame the autofocus as well. <sighs> what good is it getting this new camera if it's going to do this to me? All right. So, in one sense, there's radiation. And if I haven't said so already, if an astronomer says radiation, they usually mean light. And uh, the radiation of the sun can probably be best expressed by considering its luminosity. The luminosity of the sun has a value 
of four times 10 to the 26 watts, and that remains constant over time. We believe that the sun's luminosity has held roughly constant for the majority of its lifetime. Now that's a teensy bit of a lie. It turns out that stars sometimes brighten over time and their luminosities over very long time scales can increase. But let's not hit you with that just yet because that's too much, okay? Let's just start by imagining the sun's radiation, its, its light output is constant. And when I say radiation by light, I mean the types of things that come out of the electromagnetic spectrum. Or electromagnetic waves is what I'm talking about. On the other hand, the sun also gives off another type of emission, and that's particle emission. The particle emission goes under the name of the solar wind. The solar wind is not electromagnetic rays, but actually particles, physical particles that are parts of atoms that get burst out of the sun when it ejects plasma into space. So let's define the solar wind as a stream of charged particles um, that is emitted by the sun. And we're going to add to that, especially during things like solar flares and coronal mass ejection, especially during solar flares and coronal mass ejections. Can you guys read that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, cool. Yeah. Um, there are three main particles that make up the solar wind. Although there's more, more to it than this, but basically there are three or four particles that we see coming from the solar wind. Imagine taking, let me increase the writing on that, three or four types of particle. The particles include protons, three electrons, <clears throat> um, something that, is, that physicists call an alpha particle. And alpha particles are basically a helium nucleus. And then lastly, maybe helium ions or um, heavy ions from metals. Although these are much rare, these are rarer. Can you guys read all that gibberish? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, students, what's no. the yeah. Oh, pardon? You didn't see it. Sorry. Students, what's the nucleus of a helium atom comprised of? If I uh, say helium atom, do you, do you have a big question mark in your head or do you know what the shit I'm talking about? I know what you're talking about. Two protons. Two protons, uh, two neutrons. Thank you. Okay, Riker, uh, Riker knows can. me. He knows what I'm talking about. Let's get our red crayon out of here. Hey, crayon. We're going to need some, some red markers. Oh, I guess I could use these little guys. I took a bunch from the lab before I left. Okay, I'll get down with this. So, so the nucleus of a helium atom is two protons and two, two neutrons. Actually, maybe we ought to take this as a separate, no, that's pretty, that's a pretty tiny marker there. I don't know if that's gonna do it for us. Just a second guys, I'm looking for my red marker. 
Here we go. Marker hoops. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. Do we have all these notes, everyone? Because I want to erase and write some other stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I got them. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about this term radiation because it's going to be part of my dangerous demo that I want to do today that I didn't get around to last time. Uh, I'm erasing now, so shout at me if you don't like that. Oh, no. Permanent marker. Oh, no. No. It says wet erase. Oh, no. Uh, you got to get some water. I'll fix this. Let's see, wait. All right. Shoot, one second. All right, now that he's gone, let's talk bad about him. <laughs> <laughs> I like my hair. Okay, we got it. Aww. I don't know what that was, but it wasn't coming off. It's a wet erase marker, not a dry erase marker. <laughs> yeah. I guess, what's the difference? I'm not sure. Uh, one requires liquid. Oh, I see. I see. <laughs> I don't know. I was just grabbing stuff out of the drawer in a frenzy. I wasn't paying too close attention to what it was. Oh, we need half a Okay. Now my board looks a little nicer for y'all. Okay. Thanks for putting up with me here. Let's not do that again. That was stupid. Oops. Okay. I want to talk a little bit about radiation. Um, radiation can mean two different things depending on who you're talking to. When you talk to an astronomer or a physicist, radiation usually means electromagnetic waves. If you guys remember, I have a kind of mnemonic device. Come on, you autofocus. Okay, I have a mnemonic device to remember the regimes of the electromagnetic spectrum. It goes gamma rays, X rays, UV, visible, infrared, and radio. Or sometimes I call it YXUver, okay? With this being short wavelength electromagnetic waves, and these are long wavelength. This is what uh, a physicist or an astronomer thinks when you say radiation. But radiation can also mean particle radiation, especially if you're talking to a medical doctor or someone who works for the, um, uh, you know, one of these atomic agency walk watchdogs that track nuclear weapons around the Earth. Um, radiation can also mean particle radiation. And this is the type of radiation originally studied by Madame Curie in, I don't know, 1903, the first woman to ever win a Nobel Prize in physics. And up until a year ago, the only woman to win a Nobel Prize in physics for her studies of particle radiation. And she classified three types of rays in her laboratory that she originally thought might be electromagnetic waves but that turned out to be particles, kind of, sort of. The three types of rays that she classified, she called alpha rays, beta rays, and gamma rays, after the first three letters of the Greek alphabet. Now, alpha radiation turned out to be what today we call an alpha particle, and it turned out to be a free-flying helium nucleus. That is two protons, if you can see that red marker there, and two neutrons. Beta rays, upon further investigation, turned out to be just a free electron. And weirdly, in a goofy twist, gamma rays turned out to not be a particle, but actually turned out to be the same gamma rays as we have in our electromagnetic spectrum. 
So these gamma rays are actually photons and are actually electromagnetic rays. That's what makes this very confusing. So if a medical doctor talks about exposure to radiation, they're usually talking about Madame Curie, alpha, beta, gamma. I've got some glare on my board here from the sunshine. What did the alpha rays end up turning out to be? Alpha particles. Alpha. And, uh, but the, he specified more with like uh, something about helium. I'm sorry, can you say that question again? I'm not sure I understand it. What did the, uh, the alpha rays or the alpha particles end up being? Like, what are they? Well, they're a helium nucleus in which the, the, the electrons have been torn off. It's literally oh, okay. the helium atom. And so you can think of them as this, this, this particle composed of two protons and two neutrons that flies through space with a very high kinetic energy and it can bash into things. Uh, for instance, <clears throat> Let me show you guys uh, once again those videos from the trace satellite now that we're having a discussion here. Uh, I'm going to share screen again and I'm going to exit this slideshow and I'm going to go over to the uh, sun movies from trace and I'm once again going to show you guys a picture of a coronal mass ejection imaged with this older trace satellite. Uh, okay, can you show it to me? Okay, we'll use this uh, Windows Media Player. Okay, so can you guys see my screen here? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Now you can see a, a powerful magnetic field on the sun, let's loop that, and it's causing an eruption. And a moment after eruption, you can see static hitting the camera. That static you're seeing is the solar wind striking the pixels of the CCD camera, the digital camera, and causing electrical interference. So we can actually see the solar wind here in the form of these ions striking the camera. Now, um, <clears throat> I can't remember if I showed you this picture last time and if we talked about it, but the solar wind is accompanied by eruptions of particles, uh, or sorry, the particles in the solar wind often interact dynamically with the other planets, including Earth. Where is my picture of, of these eruptions here? Huh, did I, put, did I move them around to the end? Here we go, right? So during a coronal mass ejection, function F581, you'll have some kind of eruption uh, that, that ejects plasma in the form of solar wind and the solar wind will stream throughout our solar system colliding with the other planets. Mercury and Venus lack a magnetic field, so those solar wind ions either strike the, the rock or the dirt and create basically tiny little uh, nuclear explosions where they, they kick atoms off the surfaces of the planets, but it doesn't have too much effect. Venus's atmosphere has been significantly degraded over time by the solar wind. It hasn't lost a lot of atmospheric gases, but it's changed Venus's chemical composition by breaking apart water molecules in Venus's atmosphere. That's a whole story from my Astronomy 1010 class, but we'll, we'll tantalize you with it. Because Earth is protected by a geomagnetic field, our magnetic field traps particles and causes them to oscillate and gyrate around our magnetic fields, where they go in spiraling down towards the North or South Poles depending on whether they have a positive or a negative charge. And when those ions, which have been reduced in kinetic energy, strike our upper atmosphere, they create the beautiful uh, aurora borealis in the northern hemisphere and the aurora australialis in the southern hemisphere. And these are, of course, uh, beautiful light shows. Did we talk about this last time? You mentioned a little bit. I mentioned it a little bit, okay. A little bit. Um, if we wanted to have some fun here, and we always want to have some fun, we can quickly go to YouTube and look for uh, some time-lapse videos of Aurora Borealis. They've got a couple of good ones of, of lights. Uh, this one's in 4K. You know, they'll go to Norway and someone will leave their video camera on all night. Let's get rid of the cheesy music, which is no doubt gonna come. Um, but let's look at these curtains here. You can, I'm gonna minimize the screen a bit. 
you can see here these beautiful sheets and curtains of greens and reds and violets. And these are all ions from the sun emitted. These are all uh, solar wind particles which are striking our atmosphere, creating this beautiful light show that no doubt terrorized or frightened uh, Inuits or people who live below it. Or maybe they just saw it as beautiful, I don't know. Hey class, I got a question for you. Suppose I took my spectroscope. Where's that damn spectroscope? Here it is. Suppose I took my spectroscope from our spectroscopy lab, and suppose I pointed it up at the aurora borealis, and I broke that light apart into its component wavelengths. What type of spectrum do you think the aurora would produce? And I'm talking like Kirchhoff's laws, Kirchhoff's laws type of spectrum. Do you guys understand the question? Yeah, would it be an emission spectrum? That's right. Why would it be an emission spectrum, uh, Riker? That one was kind of shot in the dark. I'm not going to lie to you on oh, that. Really? Well, yeah. Is it because it's in the sun? Well, I know it wasn't. Uh, I know it wasn't the black bodies, but it was. I was. It was either going to be absorption or emission. I was hoping that you would then re just regurgitate the definition of what creates an emission spectrum from Kirchhoff's laws of radiation. Does anyone remember that? Uh, These are the kind of things hot that hot gas, hot thin gas. Yeah, a hot thin gas, a hot low density gas. Mike, Mike Low, thank you. thanks, Mike, thanks Riker for helping us figure that out. In fact. I believe, students, that these green lines, can you guys still see my screen here, the aurora and the green yeah. belts of aurora? Yep. I think this green emission line that you're seeing here is an emission line produced by oxygen during the four to three transition. I heard that or read that somewhere, and I, I can't remember where now, but I believe this is the four to three transition of oxygen that's responsible for this beautiful green color in the aurora. So you're kind of seeing this is similar to what you saw in those gas tubes in our spectroscopy lab, but it's happening in our whole damn atmosphere. Okay, cool. So let's pause that and we'll come back to that later. Um, <clears throat> guys, notice that you do not see a couple of players here in Madame Curie's three different types of radiation. What particles seem to be missing from this list? Particles that might've been present say in the solar wind. Something is missing here. Electrons? No. No. Beta rays of electrons, and they make up some of the particles in the solar wind. This is like the the ions. I was just about to say, yeah, the ions. Uh -huh. Okay, the ions aren't there. Um, although some of the radioactive materials that um, the radioactive materials that Madame Curie were studying obviously produced what are called daughter nuclei, right? And I think last time I remember sharing the difference uh, uh, between fusion and fission with you guys. That's what I remember talking about. And if you look at this slide here, slide 52, you can see that in the process of fission, which was the sorts of materials that she studied, I know she studied radium and, um, I don't know if she studied uranium, but maybe polonium or something like that. Radium was one of them. Uh, large, big nuclei like uranium-235 will split apart and they will eject daughter nuclei, which are themselves radioactive. In the case of U-235, it, it sort of deteriorates into radioactive cesium and radioactive rubidium, along with some gamma rays. Here they're just showing it as pure energy, but it's probably in the form of gamma rays. Notice that this nucleus is spitting out a few neutrons too. I guess what I was hoping you guys would say is, hey, Brendan, I noticed that three protons were a part of the solar wind. Why aren't three protons a part of the original particle radiation studied by Madame Curie? I thought that might be a question that people, I, that was a question I would have if I was a student. Hey, why aren't three protons a part of what Madame Curie saw? I love it. Yes. Thanks, Mike. Um, I think because during nuclear reactions, it's very hard to get a nucleus to give up a free proton. 
unless you're dealing with hydrogen, which the sun is mostly made out of, and you're ionizing that hydrogen, occasionally nuclei will spit out a neutron, but neutrons can't live very long in free space. They kind of separate themselves into protons and electrons. But, but protons are not that easy to, it's not easy to get a nucleus to give up a proton. It holds onto them dearly. I think that's the answer. I would need a nuclear physicist to really sort of solidify that for me. Okay, anyways, now that we've talked about this, uh, we'll come back to radiation later on when we deal with nuclear fusion. Let's go ahead and let's study our layers of the sun now. We are going, I'm, uh, I'm going to erase students. Okay. Morgan, you cool? Yes. Okay. Okay, we're going to make a sort of analogy with a planet as we go through these uh, six layers of the sun here. And I want to talk about each of them. Now, it's important for us to study these layers carefully because after this lecture, we're going to go on and we're going to think about differences between other types of stars. And knowing our layers, of the, oh, this autofocus is driving me crazy. Knowing the differences in our, I wonder if there's something I could do to fix the autofocus, like. I think it's because you're moving like close to the camera and then further away as you like right on the board. I think that's the reason why. It, like, yeah, I guess if I stay fixed, but I kind of have to turn around. Yeah. I'll try so to like, move less. Uh, that's a good point, Ramos. Okay, let's start with um, the outermost layers of the sun. Layers six and five are called, wait for it, the corona and the crona. <laughs> Do you guys know why they call the coronavirus the coronavirus? Why? Because the... <laughs> the little protein spikes at the edge of the virus resemble the corona of the sun. It's named after uh, the sun. Um, yeah, yeah. Taken together, these two, these two layers of the sun function somewhat like a planetary atmosphere. You can think of them as, sort of, it's, a, it's a very loose analogy, okay? But you can think of this as kind of like the atmosphere of the sun, if you make an analogy with a planet. Um, taken together, the corona and the chromosphere are both, well, let's start by listing their temperatures. They have two different temperatures. The corona is usually pegged to the extraordinary temperature of 1 million Kelvin, while the chromosphere is a little bit more modest than that at 10,000 Kelvin. And both of these layers are hotter than the photosphere below it which is a little bit strange if you think about it. Normally, normally uh, colder layers sit on the outside of a star and warmer layers sit on the inside, but this is, this is an exception here. And let's just define them down below in blue. Both of these layers are high temperature, low density plasmas, that are being heated by magnetic field lines. Magnetic fields interact with plasma, as you learned last time. And the magnetic fields act almost like a, like a stirrer or like something that's mixing up pancake batter. The magnetic fields churn and stir up the plasma, kicking particles up into higher kinetic energies and colliding them with other gas particles nearby. Let's look at uh, a couple of pictures of them from my slideshow. Um, let's back up here. Okay, here's a picture uh, of the sun's corona seen with a, a device called a coronagraph. If you guys look, you can see uh, that they've blocked out the photosphere of the sun and that the corona is a wispy and patchy layer of plasma surrounding the sun. It's not uniformly spherical, but has things called coronal holes or gaps and then long streamers, 
which extend away from the sun almost, what is that? That's like one to two solar uh, diameters across. If this is the diameter of the sun, these things extend out to one or two times the diameter of the sun. So it's kind of a, a very wispy layer of plasma that's extremely hot. Now, the corona actually gives off a very small, well, a faint amount of visible light. At 1 million Kelvin, this gas is so stupid hot that it's emitting radiation across the electromagnetic spectrum, including in uh, visible light. So we can actually see the corona during a total solar eclipse. Let's call up a picture here. Oh, thanks for those donuts. I appreciate it. Um, let's call up a picture of a total solar eclipse. And, um, and these are pictures from the most recent one. We'll try to get a high resolution one. Tools, size, large. And you can see here that this person during the most recent uh, solar eclipse, uh, right as the disk of the moon covers the disk of the sun, you can see this faint eerie white light of the corona uh, uh, coming from the sun. There are scientists who are, occupy a special region of physics and astronomy called space physics. And these are, these are scientists who make their entire careers studying high temperature, low density plasmas that surround the sun and also other planets as well. Like um, our ionosphere can be considered a, a plasma surrounding the earth. And in this branch of astronomy called space physics, people make a big deal about studying the gas of the corona and trying to understand how magnetic fields have heated these gases up. Of course, uh, that means that you're gonna have to travel around the world to exotic locations so that you can witness as many solar eclipses as possible and study this faint light from the corona. So you might be drinking pina coladas on your, um, on your cruise boat out in uh, the Pacific Ocean because it was absolutely vital for your research to go out there and uh, take some images of the corona during a total solar eclipse. It's tough work. <laughs> Somebody's got to do it, okay? Um, of course, the best way to see the, uh, to see the corona is not actually in visible light, but it's primarily by using X-ray light. And in my slideshow, when we saw the sun uh, close to say, what is this here? This is maybe uh, 33 nanometers or so. So it's technically UV, I believe, but close to X-rays. Function F5. This is, the, this is the best way. This is the best way for us to observe the uh, corona. Now, it doesn't look like it's extending as far in this picture, but I assure you that these layers that you're seeing of gas are many, many kilometers above the surface of the photosphere. So we're actually seeing the corona here. Riker, I'm digging this little dog. You know, the 10, 10 students, they've got cat crew and you guys got dog crew. Um, let's stop sharing for a second and let's try a little sample problem. Before we go any further, I wanna show you that we can apply Wien's law to the high temperatures in the corona in the chromosphere and get a vague sense of what wavelengths they should be emitting principally. So what I'd like to do is say, here's a question. The question is find the peak wavelength emitted by, and we'll start with the corona, whose temperature is 1 million Kelvin. Do you guys remember your Wien's law? What's the Wien's law all about? Crap, what was the Wien's law? Oh. It's, um, Wavelength max equals 2.9 times 10 to the 6 nanometers times Kelvin over temperature. What do you say we cheat and we'll just use 3 million nanometer Kelvins? Because 2.9s are boring. We don't have time for that. And that's divided by the temperature, right? Yep. Okay, class. So if you plug in 1 million Kelvin, what do you get for an answer? Here's a hint. You really shouldn't need a calculator for this. Three nanometers. That's right. And in what regime of the electromagnetic spectrum? 
is this three nanometer light found? X-rays. That's right. Suppose I were to ask instead about the chromosphere. What would the peak wavelength be then? 0.3 nanometers. No, try better. It's 3 million nanometer kelvins over 30,000 kelvins. It's not 0.3. Man, I'm gonna have a sip of coffee because I'm getting tired just look, looking at you guys. You're just- 10 nanometers. What's that? 10 nanometers. Not 10, right? You're close, Riker, but you're not there. Oh, by the way, I plugged in 30,000, which is a reasonable, a reasonable temperature of the chromosphere, but let's do 10,000 just for the hell of it. That's what I set up here. But that's, it's. Sorry. That's why I was looking. I was looking at thirty thousand. It'd be thirty nanometers. No. Look, what is this in scientific notation? What is ten thousand in scientific notation? I thought oh. there's no scientific Four. notation. Someone said it. I did. What, what did you say? One times ten to the four. Oh, that's okay, why I'm that's Marcus. Zero. That sounds like Marcus. Marcus, what's 10 to the 6 over 10 to the 4? <laughs> uh, that would be 10 to the 2. And what's 10 to the 2? 10 to the 2 uh, nanometers. All right, guys. You've got a bunch of pieces here. I need you to glue them together. I 300, hear 300 nanometers. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Now you're talking sense. I you missed know? a zero. That's what I was doing. <laughs> You did, you missed a zero, but I think it's difficult sometimes if you're doing one number in scientific notation, the other's not in scientific notation. Okay, whatever, we figured it out. What, elect what regime of the electromagnetic spectrum is 300 nanometer? UV. Yeah. So you can see the message that I'm trying to, to give to you guys is that the corona is principally emitting its light in the X-ray portion of the spectrum because it's super hot. Whereas the chromosphere, it's emitting its peak wavelength in the ultraviolet portion of the spectrum. Let's see that in action in my slideshow by sharing my screen. And let's click over, oof. And allow me to show you a picture of the uh, chromosphere or a picture of the sun at ultraviolet wavelengths. So here's the corona, here's the chromosphere. The only way to see the chromosphere of the sun is to take an ultraviolet camera and to image the sun in UV. Notice that like the corona, the chromosphere is also patchy. It kind of looks like a dog with the mange or something, since I'm talking to dog crew here. Um, there are these coronal holes, as they call them, and places where the magnetic fields are stirring up the plasma, it's not a very homogeneous layer of the sun. It's wispy, okay? All right, maybe that's enough said about those two layers. Next, we get to what is arguably the coolest layer of the sun, and that's the photosphere. Okay, so let's do a little bit on the photosphere next. Uh, class, I'd like to erase. Is everyone uh, comfortable with me doing that? I'm all good. Yeah, okay. okay. All right. So layer four is the photosphere. And there's no end of things I can tell you about the photosphere. The photosphere can be thought of as being like the surface of the sun. But remember that it is not a... Oh, my camera's freaking out. You know, if it didn't autofocus, it would actually just be a perfect camera. Try going really close Is and then slowly back away. Oh, no. I said slowly. 
Mm -hmm. Get close until it focuses and then slowly back up. This is such an irritating feature. Yeah, I'm switching back to the camera that actually works. I know. There, there we, we go. go. Can you turn autofocus off? I've been trying to for days. I've been trying to turn it. If you guys, you guys are better than at technology than me. If you figure it out, What's let me know. What's the name of your webcam? It's a Logitech nine twenty two. All right. I've looked everywhere. There, there is a program associated with it, and you can turn off autofocus in that program but I can't run that program and zoom at the same time. So as soon as I like turn that program off, uh, then it just goes right back to autofocusing again. It's a terribly stupid design. And I'm gonna put this on YouTube. So if anyone from Logitech hears it, F you, this camera sucks. <laughs> Go back to the drawing board and get your design team. Like honestly, if you would just not- Yeah, everything that I found involves using the, uh, the Logitech software. Yeah, you can't act, the camera doesn't want to be controlled by two software at the same time. It doesn't allow that. So Zoom doesn't have a way to turn off autofocus, and I can't run that program at the same time as Zoom. That's the problem. Anyways. That's very sad. One of the reviews for it is the webcam works great when it works. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> oh, that's, that's pretty sucky. I know. Well, I'll have to get another one or something. Okay, so here's the photosphere. Let's just try to go back to this as long as our focus holds. Maybe if I just move a little bit further away. Okay. There we go. The photosphere is the coolest layer of the sun. And um, it has a technical definition. The definition of the photosphere it is defined in the following way. As that layer from which the visible light uh, from the sun is emitted. Interesting points to note about it is that this layer is only 50 kilometers thin. I didn't say thick, I said 50 kilometers thin. Because 50 kilometers is an extremely thin layer in comparison to the radius of the sun. Do you guys remember what the radius of the sun was from our earlier lectures? No. Well, look it up in your notes. That's why I gave them to you. 700,000 kilometers. Very good. Let's draw a little picture and try to compare these two things. Imagine that this is the sun, okay? And imagine that this is the sun's radius. And the sun's radius is 700,000 kilometers. And now here's the photosphere, which is a layer that's, I don't know. 50 kilometers, 50 kilometers. In thickness. What percentage of the sun's radius does the photosphere comprise? Not much. <laughs> well, let's be technical about it, because I think you'll find something interesting if you do this problem with me. What do you get when you divide 50 kilometers by 700,000 kilometers? Seven times uh, 10 to the negative fifth. Or Seven times 10 to the minus five. What is that as a percentage, Michael? If that's who um, was talking? Yeah, um, it's. It wasn't. No, oh. Michael Lowe. There's two Michaels now. Sorry, it's okay. um, zero, uh, point zero 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 0.0007. Yeah, like, double oh, like point double oh 0.007, right? Yes, it's seven, um, yes. Percent, okay. I'm not sure that you guys can appreciate just what I mean or just what this means. So let's try to do an analogy and compare it to something. Hold on a second. What if the sun 
were scaled down to the size of a yellow onion, like this one that I got from my kitchen here. What do you think the radius of a yellow onion is in centimeters? 10. I bet 10 is its diameter. Let's see. Well, can I show oh, 10 is probably its diameter, yeah. This one has a diameter of eight. Oh, oh that was so four centimeters. Four, yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's try to do this. So let's compare it to a yellow onion. So here's my yellow onion. The yellow onion has a radius of four centimeters. What if we tried to compare the photosphere to this papery skin that comes off of a, of a yellow onion? This is fun. I don't get to do these steps of demos in class. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Never. I'm a tough guy. Okay. So what do you think the, what do you think the thickness? Maybe here's where the stupid zoom feature will come in handy. What do you think the thickness of onion skin is. I might use my iPhone for this, but. I like a millimeter if. No, look, if that's one of the things is a millimeter. Look how thinner. Look how much like thinner. A third of a millimeter? Huh? Yeah, it's a millimeter. Like a third of a millimeter? No, not even a third. I bet it would take 10 of these. Here, this is how we're going to do a millimeter. It. We'll take it and we'll fold it up a bunch of times. Two, three, Four, five, uh, it's cracking and crumbling. Let's see if we can compare a millimeter. This is like about, I'm getting onion skins all over the place. This is fun. Oh, wow, it does really zoom in focused. So this is maybe. About half there. About like half a millimeter. <laughs> so, so then it's 10 sheets to make a millimeter, right? Yep. Yeah. So what's the thickness in millimeters of onion skin? Like one tenth or something? Point one millimeters. How many centimeters is that? Because we gotta compare it to these four centimeters. Point zero one centimeters. Good. Point you guys know your metric system, I like that. Okay, so what percentage of an onion does the skin of an onion comprise? One percent. Is that one percent? That's the way my math works. Ten over four is like two point five, right? So you can't be exactly correct there. Could you do it in your calculator? Point oh oh two five. Okay. What is that as a percentage? Point two five percent. Okay. Believe it or not, I have a point. What is my point? That by comparison, the uh, layer. Uh, the on like the what would you call it the outside layer of the onion is a lot thicker in comparison to the photosphere is to the sun. How many times thicker? If you, if you scale the sun down to the size of an onion, how many times thinner than onion skin would the photosphere be? Yeah, I, I don't. Uh, zero point zero two eight times thicker. Say that, Morgan? 0 0.028 times the air. No, that 0. If your number is less than 1, it's not bigger. It's smaller. About 36 times bigger. Yeah, how did you get that, Michael? Can you explain that to them? I, don't oh, think I, just, I just divided. Um, yeah, I just divided that into the, zero, uh, the 007. Percent. Yeah, so you did 0. 0.25 divided by 0. 0.007. And, and what number did you get, uh, Michael, again? Uh, 35.7. I just rounded to 36. Thirty-six times thinner than the skin of an onion. Think about that. 
if the sun were the same size as a yellow onion, the photosphere would be, okay, it's not a 50th, but it's, it's getting up there. It's a 40th maybe of the skin of an onion. That's pretty crazy. And there's a, re there's a reason why I'm sharing this with you. Do you guys see this picture of the sun here, this picture of the photosphere? Yeah. Look how yep. sharp the edge of the sun is. The sun is not supposed to look sharp. It is a ball of gas. And you can see that those outer layers, the corona and the chromosphere, when properly viewed in ultraviolet or when properly viewed in X-ray light, they're patchy and they're distributed and they're oozing away into space. But now we get to the photosphere, this one hyper thin layer which produces all of the sun's visible light. And the sun looks like a perfect disc. It looks like a candy coated M&M with a solid surface. The surface is not solid at all. The gas in the photosphere is a tenth the density of the air in the rooms that we're sitting in. It's less dense than the air that you're breathing. And look how sharp and crisp it looks. And that's because that layer is so thin in comparison to the radiance of the sun. You can even see this kind of interesting effect. Can you guys see how it's a little brighter towards the center and a little bit darker towards the edge of the sun? Yeah. yeah. That's called limb yeah. darkening. And if you think about why uh, the sun looks a little bit darker at the edge, imagine that this onion here is the sun and this skin is the photosphere. When you're poking your, uh, your line of sight right down through the center, you're looking down into the sun by 50 kilometers thick. But as you slice through the edge of the sun, you don't penetrate as deep into the photosphere because if you imagine putting a pin through this onion, it wouldn't go as deep into the sun along the edge. That means you're seeing brighter regions 50 kilometers down here, but on this side, you're only penetrating down maybe 30 or 20 kilometers giving the edge a slightly darker appearance. This is a thing in astronomy, it's called limb darkening. In any case, this is why the sun appears, and let's bring this back to an earlier slide from another part of my lecture. If you think about it, uh, we can see the sun on our sky, especially if we take out our, our solar eclipse shades. Oh man, you know what? At some point today, uh, after our last week's lecture, the sun finally did come between those two buildings and I set up my solar telescope and it was really cool. So I'd like to be able to do that during our lab today. Let me just check really quick. This is 654. I can just barely see the sun over the tops of the buildings. Maybe we should try it as a fun experiment to see if we can see it through our, our second. Second. Should we try goofing around? You should. Yeah. yeah. We should just goof off for one second, shouldn't we? Yeah. Are you guys cool with that? Just one second? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Share screen, Zoom be Britain. Okay, so here I have my solar shades. Let's see if we can see just how thin uh, the edge of the sun is. Let's go ahead up here. And I can see sunlight coming in. Oh, well, it kind of worked. Did you see it? it yeah. Was, yeah. It's much yeah. better if I do it with the solar telescope, but for the to solar telescope to work, I need the, uh, 
I need the sun to come between those two buildings so I can actually point the thing at it. If that happens, it'll happen towards the end of our lab and that'll be great. Our lab is very short today, by the way. It's only about 20 minutes, 30 minutes long. So that might give me a minute to actually set up the solar telescope and put my uh, iPhone up to it if you guys would like to see that. It's kind of cool. Um, okay, so other things that we can talk about when we talk about the photosphere. We should talk about the process that generates light at the surface. So the photosphere, um, its energy source, it's, it's illuminated by thermal black body radiation. And that means, if you remember your lectures on the electromagnetic spectrum, thermal black body radiation means I glow because I'm hot. It is the temperature of the photosphere alone that is responsible for the production of light. Um, the temperature of the photosphere has a well-defined value, an average value of 5,800 Kelvin. And that means that the radiation that the, the photosphere is producing is very uniform because the temperature is so constant. In fact, if you were to look at the photosphere as what an astronomer calls a parallel plane atmosphere, the medium temperature is 5,800 Kelvin. Probably the bottom temperature is close to 7,000 Kelvin and the top is probably closer to around 4,000 Kelvin, something like that. And so this of course is your 50 kilometer thick layer and radiation is being produced at all depths in this layer. Now, this is kind of like Goldilocks and the three atmospheres. Down here, the gas is too thick. And while the gas is hot, the photons cannot escape into space without banging into another atom. So here, uh, here I've got an atom, right? And the photon will get absorbed before it can make its way through. Up here, at the top of the photosphere, the gas is too thin and it cannot produce enough light for your eyeballs to see it. But right at the photosphere, at this thickness, this is where you have the right mixture of gas, not too thick, not too thin, just the right temperature, produces a whole lot of visible light. And those are where the sunbeams come that tickle your face on a, uh, a sunny uh, Sunday afternoon when you're at the beach, all right? Of course, the photosphere is also where we find sunspots. What's up with those sunspots? Here are some sunspots. There are some sunspots. Oh, you know what? Maybe we should uh, add one more thing here. So let's, let's jump uh, back to the photosphere for a second. If you zoom in on the photosphere, let's say you were to take a little patch of this yellow looking light, and you were to just zoom into it really, really close up, you would discover that it's not as uniformly illuminated as you think, but that the photosphere is coated with a fine bubbling pattern called granules. These are not the same as sunspots. They're much smaller than sunspots. Let's take a note on that. The photosphere is covered in um, fine spots. It's a pattern they're called granules. And the granules are something like Texas sized blobs of hot and cool gas rising up from below. You'll notice that here I said gas and not plasma. At 6,000 Kelvin, much of the uh, material that we have here in the photosphere is actually in the gaseous state. Only a small fraction, maybe 1% or so, is even ionized. So the photosphere is really a gas. And usually what happens is you have 
a hot bubble, and the hot bubble is shining away photons into space, and then sitting next to it, you'll have a darker, cooler bubble. And this cooler bubble has shined away a lot of its light and is now sinking back into space. This is a hint at the layer that's to come underneath us, known as the convection zone. The bubbles deliver photons to the surface of the star. Let's share that screen again. Anywhere you see a hot bubble, those bubbles are rising up and shining light into space. Anywhere you see a cool patch or a cool bubble, those are sinking back down into the sun to be reheated like pea soup. Of course, sunspots are much larger than this, and they're not caused by the normal convection inside the sun. Here's a wonderful picture showing a comparison, this is slide 72, between the granules and a sunspot. And you can see that in comparison, what did we say the typical size of a sunspot was when we did it the other day in our class? How big did one of these suckers turn out to be? I remember it was bigger than Earth. Bigger than Earth. So let's think of a sunspot as being Earth-sized. Let's try a quick investigation using the Stefan Boltzmann law in Lean's law, and let's learn something about sunspots. Class, can I erase? Yep. yep. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, how many? I gotta check my time. Twelve thirty-nine. Ah, bloody hell. Okay. Oh, is it really? Huh? I didn't realize it was twelve thirty-nine either. I know. I did this yesterday. Yesterday I talked too long. I can't do that to you guys. It's twelve forty. So, something to say about sunspots. Sunspots are Earth-sized um, patches that are being trapped by magnetic field lines. And this is how sunspots get so much colder than the surrounding plasma. Usually what happens is you've got your photosphere and you've got some powerful magnetic field line that's threading throughout the sun. And wherever those field lines terminate, they trap the plasma there, preventing the bubbles from rising and setting. And you develop a patch that gets colder and colder and colder by continuously shining its light into space. And it starts to become cooler than the surrounding material. So if typically the photosphere is at 5,800 Kelvin, the temperature of a sunspot might drop down to something like 3,500 Kelvin or something like that. Now, if you apply the Stefan Boltzmann law, you can calculate how much brighter the photosphere is compared to a sunspot. I know that the brightness of the photosphere goes as the fourth power of the temperature of the photosphere. The brightness of a spot will go as the fourth power of a sunspot. And if I divide these two things and apply a little bit of algebra, I find the ratio of the photosphere to the ratio of a spot raised to the fourth power will give me my difference in flux. Or 5,800 Kelvin over 3,500 Kelvin can you guys plug that into your calculators for me real quick? Put my calculator. What? That's what I was wondering where I put my calculator. I get 7.5 or approximately eight times. What does that mean? The sunspot is eight times cooler than the photosphere? No, cooler is temperature. It is not eight times cooler. Oh, eight times, um, or better said, 
the photosphere is eight times brighter than the sunspot? That's right. The photosphere is eight times brighter than a sunspot. What if I compared their peak wavelengths of emission using Wien's law? For the photosphere, I'd have that the maximum wavelength is 3 million nanometer kelvins divided by 5,800 kelvin. What's that give me? For the sunspot, I'd get lambda max is 3 million nanometer kelvins over 3,500 kelvin. What does that give me? Can you guys punch them up for me? Hey, don't everyone answer at once. I can't stand the cacophony of voices coming at me right now. 769 <laughs> nanometers. I'm sorry, can you say that again? 769 nanometers. 69 nanometers? Oh, seven, oh. 769. Oh, no, sorry. I did, I did the bottom one first. Oh, geez. Okay. The first one is 500 nanometers or 510. Okay, so what parts of the spectrum are these wavelengths found in? So the photosphere is still in visible light, whereas the sunspot is drifting into what color. Uh, is yellow. Nope. Red. Orange. No. Oh, wait, no. Hey, Anakin, what color? Are you there, Anakin? Yes, I'm here. All right, what color? Uh, green. That's right. This is an inside joke. Anakin got a problem wrong at her test once because she had the wrong color. She didn't know what. A I, problem? One? Yeah, just one. Anakin. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so That's Anakin, this is comment. green. Anakin, what about, uh, what about 770 nanometers? I mean, red, but can you still see that? Uh, it's at the very edge, I, I admit. So this is red infrared. Sorry, my red marker kind of sucks. Hey, class, here's a here's a question that astronomy professors they just they just love to ask their students this. Suppose the sun were covered in one big giant sunspot. What would it look like if the sun was covered in one big giant sunspot? Would it still be really bright because there was nothing to compare? Is that Nathan? Yeah. Yeah, it would still be really bright, wouldn't it, Nathan? Yeah, well, the only reason why the sunspots look dark is because the photosphere is eight times brighter. Exactly. It's a contrast issue, isn't it, Nathan? If you've yeah. done photography, you know all about this. They've exposed, I I do, they've I exposed the photographs so that you can see the photosphere of the sun, and this is 10 times darker, so it looks black. Okay, so what color would the sun be if it was coated in one big sunspot than Nathan? White. Yeah. Isn't that funny? It wouldn't be black at all. It would be white. Mm -hmm. Nicely done. Okay, I've got just a few minutes left. and oh, I've got no minutes left, but I'm going to pretend like I've got a couple minutes left. I just want to talk about the inner <laughs> layers fast, and then I'm stopping. I still have so much nuclear physics to do with you guys. I'm just not moving fast enough. It's, it's in my nature to be tardy, okay? This is part of the nature of me. Yeah. Jonathan, I, your backdrop is weird. <laughs> you like my backdrop? <laughs> um, I'm looking for your backdrop, Michael Peck. Where are you? Oh, whoa! Hey, we can, it can't be two of us at once. This is some money. I, I do like your backdrop. I think we're six feet apart, so we're okay. I think we're six <laughs> okay. feet apart. Weren't you sneezing earlier? I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> <laughs> No, this is not no, no. this is or at least it's on my stay. Guys, let me get through let me get through uh, the last little bits here and then we'll stop. I've got a very short lab for us today. So let's talk about the interior of the sun. And I'll pick this up next time, but the more notes I get down here, the less I have to diddle around with it next time.
the interior of the sun has three layers uh, of consequence. There's, there's first the convection zone. And the convection zone is a layer that comprises, oh, I don't know, maybe roughly about a third or slightly less than a third of the sun's radius. It's a much big layer, a much bigger layer than the, um, the photosphere is. We cannot directly see any of the interior layers of the sun. Ooh, that's a cool backdrop too, actually. We can't see any of the interior layers of the sun because light cannot penetrate. I don't want to say light can't penetrate down that far. Light can't get out from that depth. So we have to analyze the interior of the sun by studying sunquakes and using computer model. The convection zone is where energy is transported by convective, for lack of a better word, we're going to call them blobs. Convection works by hot blobs rising and cold blobs sinking. It's kind of similar to how a lava lamp works. Down here, you get a blob that is hot. And becoming hot, it's going to expand like a balloon. And up at the top of the photosphere, where the granules are, you're going to get it's a blob becoming cool and dense. And this will sink back down. And this is called a convection cell. This is how air circulates around inside of your room. It's one of the three modes of energy transport. Let's get down into there. So here's a little model of, this, of the uh, convection zone. You'll notice the temperature is anywhere from <clears throat> 10,000 to a million Kelvin. I think a, a temperature that at, it's usually a kind of rough and ready estimate is you put it at something like 100,000 Kelvin, and that's an average temperature. It's a very big layer, so the temperature is increasing as you go down inside of it. Um, here's how convection works in a common household room during the winter time. You've got this thing which is unfortunately called a radiator, probably should have been called a convector. And this, this thing holds slabs or pockets of air, which are in contact with the metal. The metal has been heated inside by some oil or something like that. Now the, the metal is heating up these slats of air. And as the air bubbles uh, heat up, they expand like a hot air balloon. They rise up displacing cooler air, which comes in and sinks and passes through the slats of your radiator. Convection is one of the three modes of energy transport, the other being conduction and radiation. Now convection is blobs of gas. Radiation, of course, is light. How does conduction work? Any of you get snow? What's the difference between convection and conduction? You've heard of conduction, right? Does conduction move in a straight yeah. line? Um, well, this moves in a straight line in a way. Uh, I guess they're circulating, but yeah. it's, not, it's not about the direction it moves. Huh. Con conduction is different. Uh, convection pushes big blobs or bulk matter around, but conduction is atom to atom jiggling, okay? If you leave your spoon in your soup uh, pot while it's cooking, and then you go to grab that spoon and you give yourself a little burn, it's because you are touching the hot jiggling atoms of the metal yeah. in the spoon and they are heating up the jiggling atoms of your fingertips. Conduction is atom to atom jiggling. It doesn't push big blobs around. A fun game to play is to play a game called convection, conduction, or radiation. Take something that's being heated up or cooling down in your common everyday life and ask yourself, is that convection, conduction, or radiation? Like if you cook a turkey in an oven. Convection, conduction, or radiation? Convection. Probably conduction. Depends on the oven. All right, fine. But most ovens don't have a little fan. There are some con con 
convection ovens out there. Convection but ovens. A simple oven like my oven is just a convection oven. The hot air cooks the hot well, earth. Your oven's pretty lame. Yeah, well, maybe I should come to your house next time for Thanksgiving. <laughs> okay. Go for um, it. Anyways, what if I take a potato out of the oven and I leave it on my windowsill to cool down? That raccoon will steal it. <laughs> <laughs> Right. What are you talking about? Three modes of energy transport, but yes, he probably would actually. I live in terror that one day he's going to figure out how to climb the walls and he's going to show up at my apartment and then we're going to have all kinds of hell break loose. <laughs> be your friend. You may have and the bee will come out of nowhere. Yeah. You guys can have a sleepover. <laughs> okay, I'm I'm kind of out of time here. I'm, what what am I at? Oh my gosh. Let me list the last two layers. We don't have time for any more of this stuff, and I'll pick it up next time, and we'll start talking about our lab. Let me, uh, let me list the other two layers of the sun. The other two layers of the sun are, of course, the radiation zone. The radiation zone is where the temperatures start to get really damn hot, upwards of a million Kelvin. And that means in the radiation zone, you are now dealing with a fully ionized plasma. And that means there's just a few different types of particles that are bopping around inside this thing. You've got free electrons. You've got free protons. Unfortunately, my red marker is kind of crappy, so I'll try using this pink marker. Here are some free protons. Remember. Most of this is ionized hydrogen. And you also have some short wavelength, high energy gamma rays. What color does a gamma ray want to be? Violet, because it's short wavelength. Oh, there's my other red marker. I knew you were somewhere. And here come the, the uh, x-rays and the gamma rays, which are bopping around. The photons wiggle their way through the sun by colliding with free plasma particles in a process called a random walk. So here we have photons which are scattering off. Usually they scatter off the free electrons, but we could talk about that next time. In any case, the radiation zone is not hot enough for nuclear fusion to occur, but it is a fully ionized plasma, and it's a bath of photons and particles that are all mixing around together. In some ways, it's kind of like a big pinball machine, where the photons are kind of like the pinballs, and the protons and the electrons are kind of like the bumpers, and the photons are scattering their way through, the, through this pinball machine. At last, when you get towards the very center of the star, you end up with the nuclear core. And the nuclear core has a key temperature. Do you guys remember what the temperature of the core is from our lecture last week? Temperature in which hydrogen fuses. Does anyone take notes? I, that was the lecture I missed. Huh? That was the lecture I missed, so just you can look it up. I did have it. I don't know what I did with it. It's a number that I thought would be cool if someone could remember. Oh, isn't it the one with um with pi? It's something with pi. No, that's the number of seconds in a year. Oh, whoops. <laughs> Uh, is it 100 million Kelvin? No, that's too high. Oh. It was in your homework. 15 times 10 to 6. How do you say that in English? 15 million? That's right. 15 million Kelvin. And that's the temperature at which hydrogen fusion can proceed. Now, I've 
I've burned all my time with you guys for today. I don't feel like it's appropriate to lecture for much longer than I would in a normal class. And I know attention spans can, can get taxed during these long lectures. So we'll save this for uh, Thursday. And I'm gonna somehow do chapter 15. I'm gonna do all of it. One of these days, I'm actually just gonna cover everything and everything's gonna go according to plan. It's gonna be glorious. But that wasn't today. Today, we worked our way from the exterior to the interior of the sun, learning things as we went. Okay, so let's back up here for a second and let's talk. At this point, we've, uh, we're gonna try to wrap up our lecture. We're gonna take a pause of about five minutes or so or whatever you guys need to get a cup of coffee or a drink or something. And then we are gonna do a short but fun lab on um, telescope design, okay? So we're gonna be looking at a couple of lenses. I've got a cute little setup. Uh, if I share screen, iPhone. Come on, buddy. Phone is moving slow here. Oh, geez. Hmm. Okay. Well, that's scary. I should be connected to Wi-Fi. We are definitely going to need my phone to do this. Let me try that one more time. Share screen, iPhone. Oh, technology. I love you, technology. Is that what you tell yourself? <laughs> There's always a glitch. There's always some kind of stupid glitch. Technology is great when it works. Yeah. All right, let's do this. Um, I'll try resetting my phone during the little five minute break or so, okay? So um, let's, uh, you know, let's take a pause. I'll go on mute for a second and in five minutes we'll come back. Now you, that'll give you guys time to print out your, uh, your lab sheets for the day. Do you guys have these? Yep. Okay, it's eight dash five and eight dash six, cool. Take yep. them right out of your book if you got it, Tim. If not, print them out. If you're really desperate, try to draw them out. Um, I'm gonna go get some uh, coffee or something and I'll be back in just a couple minutes and we'll get started. That'll give me time to reset my phone. Wait, so like we find those sheets um, on Blackboard? Yeah, uh, let me show you where. Share screen, okay. Uh, let's get out of my radiation zone for a second. And let's go to Blackboard. And, oops, hold on a sec. Here we are on Blackboard, right? Are you seeing my screen? Who, Ramos, is that you? Yeah, it was me. So, Ramos, uh, you go to the section called Lab, and then you yeah, go yeah. Lenses and Telescopes. Do you see that right there, Lenses and Telescopes PDF? Yeah, I got that, yeah. Print that, okay? And like we have to like print it, but I don't have a printer. So like, can I just like jot it down like in my notebook and then just submit it like what I did last week? That's yeah, but take these five minutes then to copy those pages and write all that stuff down. All uh, right, sounds good. For, for wait, for eight, six, you only need to do one, not two and three. But just get, up, get everything that you see. Actually, here you are, Ramos. Oh, I need my phone to show you what sections we're gonna use. Let me try this one more time here. Share screen. I can save you a lot of time if I can share my screen. There we go. Okay, for some reason that worked. Can you guys see this? Yeah. All right, so let me do this and this. Okay, so let me show you our setup over here. I'll twist this around. This is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to have my setup down there. And you can see I've got some lenses and some telescopes making stuff set up. And here, Ramos, this is what you're going to need for your lab to cut, chop down. What page is it? 8.5 and 8.6. Toast bread. I want more than just toasted bread. You're stupid. 
You're gonna need. Uh -oh. You're gonna need this section. This section. You don't need the section orange and blue, but you will need this section and this. Okay. If you gotta stop parking that way outside. You don't park. Really and on the back side, yes, I have room for two. don't need two and three, but you're going to need one. So, Ramos, are you still listening to me, buddy? Oh, yeah, sorry. I am. You need that part right there. Oh, and you yeah, I got it. This part, and this part, and this part, and this part. You got that? All right, part so do we need? Thing. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> just, just leave the camera there for a second. Oh, okay. I'm gonna get a drink of iced tea. I'll be right back, okay? All right. <laughs> risky. Okay. says recording i'm going to stop the recording